And so how this is going to work today, it's a little bit different format, but I'm going to be talking about Fragile X. I'm going to be talking about Fragile X um, um, POE, where, which is basically where Fragile X premutation carriers have problems with uh, premature ovarian insufficiency. And then also FTAS, FX TAS, which is basically a, a form of this disease that causes more problems with premutation carriers as they get older. And we're going to talk about each one of those things. Um, how am I going to do this? I'm going to basically run through a scenario where, where we're going to field a call from a worried friend. She's going to ask specific questions. And what I would suggest you do is just think of the answers that you would give. So if this is something that affects your family, then you can think about, well, do I know that answer? Or if it's something, if you work with people who have fragile X, do you know the answer? So each time well, I'm gonna pause, or I'm gonna try to pause just a little bit so you can think, what would you say? And then I'm gonna give you my response. At the end, we'll briefly summarize what we've learned. And if we have time, we might even take a quiz. Quizzes aren't that bad, um, but we'll see if we have time for that. So if we're ready, let's do this. So your phone rings and it's Jenna. Jenna is your college friend who just barely got married. And so you pick up the phone and you say, hi, Jenna. And she says, hi, I need your help. My sister is pregnant and she had a test that shows that she is a carrier of fragile X syndrome. She says that I need to be tested. Can you help me understand all of this? Okay, you sound a bit stressed out. I would be happy to help. Great, I know I could count on you. First, what exactly is Fragile X Syndrome? Well, Fragile X Syndrome is a genetic disorder that causes developmental delay, intellectual disability, and problems with behavior. It is the most common genetic cause of intellectual disabilities in males. So it's like Down Syndrome? Not exactly. Down syndrome is also a genetic disorder that causes intellectual disability, but Down syndrome and Fragile X are two different disorders, each with their own set of medical problems. So do kids with Fragile X look like kids with Down syndrome? No, not at all. Boys with Fragile X typically have a large head, a narrow face, a large forehead, and large ears. I have a nephew that is in special education classes. That sounds like him. Can I send you a picture of him? Sure, let's take a look. So do you think that he looks like he has fragile X? Well, let's see. Does he have a large head? Yeah. A narrow face? Yes. A large forehead? Yes, and does he have relatively large ears? I would say, yes, he does. So I must admit, he does look like he has features that are similar to that of boys that have Fragile X. Are there other features that are common in Fragile X? Boys with Fragile X often have high arch palates, flat feet, they can be double jointed, have double jointed fingers and hyperflexible joints. Large testicles are also a feature, but not until after puberty. Earlier this year, my nephew was diagnosed with autism. And last week, my sister called 911 because he was having a seizure. That also fits. Many boys with Fragile X are diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder or have behaviors that are associated with autism. Seizures are also common. So do you think he has Fragile X? <laughs> it's possible. He could be tested to see if he has a large number of repeats in the Fragile X gene, which is called FMR1. Wait, that's my next question. My sister said something about repeats, but I don't know what she's talking about. What are repeats? Sorry, I got a bit ahead of myself. Let me back up a bit and explain how Fragile X works. Please do. So in our body, we have blood cells and our blood cells have red blood cells and white blood cells. Often when we test for genetic things, we use the DNA that's in the white blood cells and the white blood cells have lots of different chromosomes, each one of which carries information about us. One of those chromos one of the different chromosomes that we have is chromosome X, uh, but there's lots of other different chromosomes as well. Um, every chromosome has hundreds of different genes on it. 
on the chromosome X, there's a specific gene called FMR1. That gene is the same gene that causes fragile X syndrome. So sometimes people call it the fragile X gene. Uh, there's a piece of this gene kind of in front of the part that makes the protein. And that part has many different repeats. In other words, it has the same three letters over and over and over again, all stacked one against another. The, every gene or pretty much every gene is supposed to make a protein. So in this particular case, the fragile X or FMR1 gene makes a protein that's important for brain development. Now, some people have more copies of the, that repeat in the front of this part of this gene. They make the fragile X protein, FMR1, but they also make a toxic product that is actually toxic to both brain and also to ovaries. Some individuals have even more numbers of repeats. When the repeat number gets big enough, it actually shuts down this gene and the gene no longer works. That means that the protein is not made. And since that protein is important for brain development, uh, that means that this can cause problems with development, intellectual disability, et cetera. So in this particular case, we would say that a person has the normal number of repeats. This one affects adults. They can have premature menopause. They can have tremors and ataxia. And in this particular case, a child would have fragile X syndrome. I can't believe it, she, your friend says. My half sister stopped having periods after her second child was born. Not only that, but my dad has started having tremors and is being seen by a neurologist. All those things could be caused by being a fragile X pre-mutation carrier. What do you mean by pre-mutation carrier? Sorry, getting ahead of myself again. Going back to what we were talking about, we talked about how depending on the number of repeats, different things could happen. Well, individuals who have the normal number of repeats usually have repeat numbers between five and 54. Other people have larger repeats. They can be between 55 and 200 different repeats. That's called a premutation. In that particular area, the premutation can actually expand or contract based on being passed from one generation to another. Individuals who have fragile X syndrome have over 200 repeats. And when that happens, then the, then the gene is shut down. This is called having a full mutation. Can people in the same family have different repeat numbers? The answer is yes. The number of repeats can change between generations. Most changes are small, but very large changes can occur when the premutation that's between 55 and 200 repeats is passed through a female. Got it. Am I likely to be a premutation carrier? Uh, it may be easier to answer that question if I can get a better understanding of your family. Tell me about your family and I will draw out your pedigree. I'll start with you. So this is a picture of her. In this case, we do her. She's a female. It has a little arrow next to her, which means that she is the person that we're talking to in clinic or in this case, <laughs> on the telephone. Okay, I have a sister who's pregnant and the baby is a boy. So we add that. She opted for testing and was found to be a carrier for Fragile X. So we put a little dot in the middle. She says she has 86 repeats. I have a brother, but my, parent, my parents are pretty healthy, but my dad is 60 now and has tremors. I have a half sister through my dad. She has two children, my nephew and a niece has learning issues. My half sister stopped having periods when she was 25. Drawing this out really does help. Let's assume that your nephew has fragile X syndrome. We're gonna color him in. Your half sister would then be a premutation carrier. Since your two sisters are premutation carriers, it's likely that your dad is too. He links the two of them. Since males only have one X chromosome, they will pass that X chromosome on to all of their daughters. 
So in this case, your dad has that X and we're gonna mark it with a, with a red X and he also has a Y chromosome. His wife, in this particular case, or his previous partner, he has two X's and we assume those are normal. Then the sister, your half sister, must have received her X, from one of the X's from her dad, and then the other X from one of, from her mom. So she's a pre-mutation carrier. We also assume that your mom has two X's that are probably normal. And so your sister, who has the 86 repeats, she probably received that pre-mutation from her dad and a normal X from her mom. That means that you're likely to be a pre-mutation carrier too because your dad can only pass on one X chromosome. So you would also be marked as a pre-mutation carrier. Is my brother also likely to be a pre-mutation carrier? No, he would have inherited your father's Y chromosome. So this would be his, his makeup. Could my niece also have Fragile X syndrome? It is possible. Girls can have Fragile X syndrome too. Since females have two X chromosomes, they usually have milder symptoms. Will my sister's baby have Fragile X? We don't know. He could have inherited a normal X from your sister. In that case, he would have a normal number of repeats. If he inherited the abnormal X, he could either have a pre-mutation or he could have a full mutation. Why is that? Pre-mutations do not always expand to a full mutation when passed through a female. What is my risk of premature menopause if I am a premutation carrier? Well, fragile X premutation ovarian insufficiency is seen in about 20% of premutation carriers. Some studies say that the risk varies depending on repeat size, but other studies didn't see a clear association. What is my risk of developing tremors if I'm a premutation carrier? Well, 45% of male premutation carriers and 16% of female premutation carriers who are over 50 will have fragile X tremor slash ataxia syndrome. The risk of de developing FTAS increases with age. What is ataxia? Ataxia is a loss of muscle coordination and it's one of the manifestations, uh, well, one of the manifestations of this is difficulty in walking. My dad has trouble keeping his balance. He also seems to be having a harder time understanding things. F task, FX task can also lead to cognitive and intellectual decline, short-term memory loss, loss of math or spelling skills, difficulty making decisions, and a decline in other intellectual functions. Is there a cure or a specific treatment for fragile X, fragile X premutation or premature ovarian insufficiency or fragile X tremor slash ataxia syndrome? Currently, there is no cure. However, children with fragile X can benefit from therapy and medical treatments typically, but medical treatments typically focus on managing symptoms. <laughs> this is a lot to take in. I know. I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me, I guess the next step for me would be to determine my repeat number. Can I call you again when I get my results? You can call me anytime, Jenna. About a month later, your phone rings again, and it's Jenna. Well, I now know my repeat number. I have 82 repeats. Hmm, how do you feel about that? Well, I knew my repeat number would be close to my sister's, but it was still a bit hard to see the result. I feel for you, Jenna. Can Fragile X be determined in a pregnancy? Yes, a pregnancy can be tested between 10 and 13 weeks of gestation by what's called chorionic villa sampling. Later in the pregnancy, an amniocentesis can be performed. You can run a Fragile X test on cells obtained from either of these tests. Are there other options for having children? Well, some couples choose to adopt children. Others choose to do in vitro fertilization with pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. What is pre-implantation genetic diagnosis? Basically, it's in vitro fertilization in which embryos are tested to see if they have fragile X. 
after testing, only embryos that don't have fragile X are implanted. Who would I talk to in order to review all these options in detail? Probably the best thing to do would be to schedule a visit with a prenatal genetic counselor. You're a great friend. Thanks, I try to be. So what are the take home messages? I think one of the take home messages is that Fragile X can impact the health of multiple family members. I think this is something that we sometimes don't really think about. We think about a child having Fragile X, but really this is a family disease. It affects everyone it touches. And even those who don't have Fragile X can be impacted by this. Males and females can have Fragile X syndrome. This is something we often forget. Males are usually more severely affected, but sometimes we don't think about this when we see a female who has symptoms that could be due to Fragile X. One of the most helpful things in this case is to look at all the family members and take a really good pedigree so you can see if there's other individuals in the family that may have premature ovarian insufficiency or ataxia or tremors. Those kind of, those kind of signs in family members should, have, should trigger somebody to say, well, hey, could this be fragile X? Because we just don't often think about this in females. The risk of going from pre-mutation to full mutation depends on the mother's repeat number, but it's not exactly easy. In other words, we used to have charts that would say, well, if your repeat number is this, this is the chance that you'll have a full mutation or a child that has a full mutation. That actually depends on a lot of different things. Maybe one thing I could explain is that where, why is the difference between males and females? When it passes through a male, there's only usually just a few repeats different. For example, I have between 80 and 85 repeats. All of my girls have about anywhere from, let's say, 85 to 87 repeats. Very, very small changes. If you go through a female, the change can be very dramatic or there may be no change at all. The reason why this is different is in males, males are constantly producing sperm. And because of that, there can be small errors and just little tiny shifts in that number. And it can actually shift down or it can shift up. In a female, all their ova or all the eggs that they have <clears throat> are actually fully formed, well, pretty much fully formed when they're born. They have to just go through one more step in order to be able to divide into an ova that can then make a baby. In that state, they are just basically in suspended animation if you wanna think about that. But there can still be damage to cells and damage to DNA when you're in that state. If there's damage, then the, the cell has to repair itself. We think that what's happening is when this area is damaged, this repeat area, the mechanisms that fix that damage actually can make the repeat expand. And so what we see is that the older women are, the more likely they're they are to have a child that has full fragile X syndrome. Why? Because their ova or eggs are older and may have had a greater chance of actually having that, having to undergo repair. Then that does not occur usually in a male who again is producing sperm on a regular basis and does not have cells that are in that type of state. And so we, I have never heard of a case where a male has passed on fragile X and had a full mutation child. It's always been the females. Female premutation carriers are at risk for premature ovarian insufficiency. This is actually an important thing to understand because a lot of people wanna have kids. And in this particular case, actually one of the most helpful things is to help people understand that if they want to have children, they should do so early and not put that off. There's a couple reasons. One is because if you put it off, there's a higher risk for having a child with fragile X, but also there's a higher risk that you will not be able to get pregnant. And so if this is something again that is desired, it's important to recognize that and say, well, we should probably think about having our family now versus having our family later. FX TAS typically occurs after age 50 and affects males much more frequently than females. We say after age 50 because there's almost no one who's affected below that age. If you said, what is the typical onset? I think currently it's thought that the typical onset is about age 65. Um, and so this is still something that it depends. It depends on when perhaps when it's diagnosed. 
My older brother is a pre-mutation carrier. He are, he's probably, I'm trying to remember, we figured this out last night. He's 68 and he's had symptoms actually for several years now. Um, he first lost his balance. He's a lawyer and his intent is to keep on being a lawyer because it is his hope that if he keeps his mind fully engaged, he'll be less likely to have problems with just slipping as far as his abilities to do things. Um, there is certainly some anecdotal evidence that if you are fully engaged, your brain does keep sharper. And so it may be a very good idea to try to keep engaged in things in order to be able to avoid this. But I don't think that there's ever been a study that proves one way or the other. Um, but again, usually no symptoms before 50 and more typically in your 60s might be a time of onset. The longer you live, the more likely you'll have some symptoms. Um, I don't know if we're ready for a little quiz. Maybe we could do a little quiz. It's not that bad, right? Everybody likes quizzes so much. We should do it. Okay, let's take a little quiz. In this particular family that has fragile X, well, who are the most likely persons to be pre-mutation carriers? So if you want to think about it, we can just start to think. If all the people who are in black have fragile X, then we might actually start at this very tip top. This person who has tremors in ataxia is probably a pre-mutation carrier. Then we can mark him. And then we'll say, well, what about her? She has a child that has fragile X. So she's probably a pre-mutation carrier. He doesn't have any kids. Plus he's a male. And so his dad would not have passed on an X chromosome to him. So he's unlikely to be one. Um, we can also think about uh, her, she has kids that have potentially fragile X, so she's probably a pre-mutation carrier. Uh, her, she doesn't have any children that have this, and she's had quite a lot of males. It's not sure, but it's probably less likely that she's a pre-mutation carrier. And in, in a female that has early menopause, in this particular family, it's likely that she's a pre-mutation carrier. If you go on a little farther, she would probably be unlikely to have this. Um, she has some difficulties in school. She might be a full mutation carrier or she could be a pre-mutation carrier. Hard to know, difficulties in school aren't that uncommon, right? So we don't really know for her, um, but we can just kind of go through all these different ones. If she is a full mutation carrier, is she at risk for, for fragile X premature ovarian insufficiency? It's an interesting thing. If she's a full mutation carrier, that gene actually gets shut down. And so in that particular case, she would not be at risk, which is kind of odd, but she doesn't make that toxic product. That toxic product is only made if you're a pre-mutation carrier. And so in this particular case, the answer would be no. Uh, is he at risk for FX TAS? Again, we assume that he has fragile X, FX TAS is also one that happens in pre-mutation carriers. Now you can say, well, he has enough issues to just have to deal with his, his, his fragile X syndrome. And the answer is that's probably true. But again, we would not expect that there would be a, a, a problem with the balance, et cetera, that would happen in a male who's a pre-mutation carrier or could happen to a male. So in this case, we would say no. Um, thanks for taking that little test. I don't know how you did. We will, we'll let you score yourself. Does that sound good? I just want to just put up some resources too. Um, there's a thing that we use in clinic called gene reviews. I actually reviewed it again before I did this particular talk because things change. For example, like I said, we used to be able to, to tell women how likely it was that their pre-mutation would go to full mutation based on their number of repeats. But since then, we've learned that the repeat actually makes a difference. In other words, if you have a little break in your repeat, it may be less likely to actually go to full mutation. In my family, I know that it can go to full mutation because I have nephews that have fragile X. But again, in each family, it might be different. So we no longer give that number unless we are actually much more certain of what that repeat looks like. Um, and so there's just things that we learn, and this is actually written for doctors to help them manage and diagnose patients with fragile X. It's gene reviews, and you can go here. Many families find this very helpful and they also run, this, run copies of this off and give it to their doctors. 
There's also the Fragile X Research Foundation, put that down, and also the National Fragile X Foundation. And again, those are places where you might want to go and just, again, learn more. Thanks, Susan, and thanks, Daryl. That was really um, so educational for me. Um, and I also have a personal perspective. So I, uh, as Susan said, I work at the University of Texas, the Texas Center for Disability Studies. I'm a former special educator and a licensed professional counselor, but I like to say that my greatest education and expertise comes from my nearly 32 years of parenting my oldest son, David, who has um, an, a relatively rare genetic um, disease that he was diagnosed with when he was three months old. And I've just been so amazed at how the study of the human genetics has changed in the 32 years of, of living with my son. Because 32 years ago, they, couldn't, they could tell us it was genetic, but they couldn't tell us what gene caused it or if we carried the gene or if we didn't. Um, and so I'm happy to say now they know so much more about that disease. They know that we didn't carry it. We had a sporadic mutation, they called it. Um, and they know so much more about how to support us and help us. But, you know, at the end of the day, after your child is diagnosed, whether they can tell you you carry the gene, whether they can tell you you don't, um, what, it, what it means in terms of prognosis and the future, at the end of the day, you got to go home and raise that child and live that life. And so what I want to share with you this morning is what we call one-page profiles, getting to know the person behind that diagnosis. Because at the end of the day, this is still a child or young adult, um, and the diagnosis is just one small piece of who they are. Oop, not going to change. There we go. And I will tell you that I'm not sharing my personal brilliance with you here. This comes from a large international group of people called the Learning Community for Person-Centered Practices. Um, so the slides and some of the work that I'm going to share with you today is being used all over our country, as well as in Great Britain, Canada, Australia, uh, most recently in Africa, and I even heard Israel. So um, it's about having people have positive control over the lives that they choose for themselves in spite of the disability. It's about helping people get better lives, not just better paper. Um, the sad thing about, and I certainly know it from my experience as a special educator, as well as a parent with a child with medical, um, a medical condition, as well as some intellectual disability, we have a ton of paper generated around our son. And when you look at all that paper over 32 years, how much of that has really made a difference in his life? I will tell you, it's a much smaller fraction of that pile of paper. So here's the key concept. If you get nothing more than this today, this will be an accomplishment because I want you to begin to think about what's important to the child you're interested in or young adult as well as what's important for them and finding balance between those two things. They sound like I'm talking about the same thing. I'm talking about two very different things. So let me explain what I mean. And I will tell you also that I um, shared a handout with Susan that um, if you uh, get in touch with her after our presentation today, you'll have this in your notes. So don't feel like you have to scramble and furiously take notes. It's in there. Important, too, is often overlooked when we have a child with a disability and or medical condition. Um, it's anything that helps that person feel satisfied, content, comforted, fulfilled, or happy. And it includes all of these things on this bulleted list. It's about the people that are in your life, the relationships you share with them, your culture, your cultural identity having purpose, having meaning in your life, feeling like you matter, having status or control. If you don't feel like you're a control freak, lose control for a few days and you'll find out how much control in your life means to you. We've all learned a lot about important too in this pandemic because all of us have lost things that were important to us 
because of the pandemic. We've lost the people that we wanted to be with in the way we wanted to be with them. We've lost having some control of where we go, what we do when we get there, um, having even control over whether we're exposed to this virus or not. We've lost that. So we all have had a sense in this pandemic year of not having some of the things that we found important to us, the things that helped us feel satisfied, content, comforted, fulfilled, or happy. It's even about how we like our pace of life or our rhythm to go, our rituals and routines. A lot of us had rituals around our daily work days that have changed because of the pandemic. All of a sudden, we were working from home. Um, I traveled for work prior to the pandemic. I traveled all over the country. And all of a sudden, I have what I call Zoom butt. I am sitting in a chair on Zoom day after day after day. It's impacted what's important to me in, an, in a not happy way always. So I think all of us can have a sense of what is important to us and how the pandemic has affected that. Now think about the child or young adult that you're interested in who has a medical condition and or disability. This was impacted by that for them way before the pandemic. Important too summarizes all of these things, but it also includes what matters most to the person, their own definition of quality of life. Um, how you and I, we use the terms quality of life like we all know what it means, but we all define that differently. So we have to think about that. I'm going to go to important four <clears throat> because this is what we get laser focused on. And I mean laser focused when we have a child or a, a person in our family with a medical condition or disability diagnosed, all of a sudden we we get laser focused on issues of health and safety. We want to take care of their medical condition, make sure they take their medicine when they're supposed to. We, we promote wellness. We want to keep them safe. We want to keep them free from fear. And so, and we want to have them be seen as a valued contributing member of their community in whatever way is possible. We get laser focused on that. So much so that often there's an imbalance. We get laser focused on important four. And if you think about in your own life, all of a sudden this pandemic has caused us to be laser focused on important four, our own health and safety, in a way that we typically weren't prior to the pandemic. So imagine the focus that you've had to pay attention to in this last year, wearing a mask, paying attention to where you went, um, what you did when you went there, you know, did you have to wipe down your groceries when you brought them in and early in the pandemic? All those things that we had to think about were important for us. When you have a diagnosis that causes people to get laser focused on important four, there's an imbalance on important four and we lose a lot of important too. And for kids with disabilities or medical diagnosis, often that's a lifelong imbalance. So know that those two influence each other and know this, none of us does what's important for us willingly, unless there's a, portent, a piece of that that's important to us. Um, if you think about when you drive a car, you drive your own car lots of places. It's not safe to drive a car. You know that, right? But you manage your important force in the context of driving your own car. You buckle your seatbelt. You pay attention to the, uh, the laws. I have to turn my phone off. You pay attention to the laws and you drive defensively, those kinds of things. You're addressing your important force, but you're doing it in the context of what's important to you, which is getting in your own car and going where you want to go. And that balance is dynamic. It's always changing. We are always having to adjust important two and four. We've had to do a lot of balancing during this pandemic. So let's try, let's take a, a quick quiz. I want to introduce my dogs, Coda and Willow. Coda is the border collie on the left, the black dog. And Willow is the golden retriever on the right. Because we live in Texas, heartworm is a big issue for dogs. Heartworm will kill these dogs. And so they have to take a heartworm preventative once a month. Let's do a quiz. And I'll just ask you to think about it for time's sake. But important two or four, heartworm preventative. Important two, 
my dogs or important for my dogs? Absolutely. Important for. It's about their health and safety. Now let's do another quiz. Peanut butter. Important to my dogs or important for my dogs? It's important to your dogs. You're right. Thank you. It's important to my dogs. But is it going to work? I'll tell you, Willow, she thinks it's a treat. It says on the box it's flavored like a treat, and she buys it. But Coda, he smells it coming out of the pantry. He knows it's not a treat. How is it going to work for Coda if I say, Coda, you can have this peanut butter after you eat this heartworm pill? Is that going to work? No, it's not. I will find the heartworm pill behind the couch because he will peel the peanut butter off and ditch the heartworm pill. I have to take the heartworm pill, important four, and wrap it up in peanut butter. And he will take it every time. That's what we have to do with our balance of important two and four. You do it when you get in the car. It's important for you to be healthy and safe while you're driving. So you buckle your seatbelt, you drive defensively, you pay attention to the laws, you drive the speed limit, but you do it in the context of what's important to you, which is driving your own car where you want to go, when you want to go. I hope that makes sense. So let's talk about mm -hmm. what we can do with that information around supporting our kids or young adults with a genetic condition. We have to support them to be healthy and safe within the framework of what's important to them. So let's talk about a one-page profile because I want to show you how to do one real quickly. And I'll show you, this is in your handout that Susan can provide to you, a blank template, but I'll show you some much more interesting place to find much more interesting templates at the end of this presentation. But in a template, you want to have, first of all, we start with what do people like and admire about this person? Um, because a lot of our kids' files have everything that's wrong with them, what they can't do, what they'll never do, what's likely to happen, the, the gloom and doom of their medical condition, all that. Nobody wants to be introduced that way. So we encourage you to start with what do people like and admire about your son, your daughter, the person you support in terms of who they are. Stay away from functioning level. We don't need to know that. Stay away from he's ambulatory or whatever. Talk about what we love about this kid, what we love about this person. Um, and then we talk about what's important to them, what's important for them, how to best support. And we put a flattering photo on there because a lot of their files have really ugly, like mugshot photos. <laughs> Here's my son's one-page profile. And I use this for medical appointments. The, the uh, information that's in white font is specific to a medical appointment. I used a picture of him driving his truck because I want medical professionals to know he has an intellectual disability, but he's very capable. He, he drives his own truck. Um, one of the first things that I want them to know that's important to David is that he wants to manage his health issues, but he doesn't want them to control his life. He wants to have a choice. And he wants you to respect him. He will know when you don't think he's competent. You know, we've had medical professionals walk in the door and immediately start talking to me, his mother, and treat him like he's not competent. He picks that up in a heartbeat, and he'll write that doctor off. So I let doctors know ahead of time. He wants you, he wants you to talk to him. He wants you to think he's competent. He may need some help understanding some of what you're talking about. And so we go down to the bottom box, which is about supporting David at medical appointments. Help me understand what you want me to do. You might have to show me. His disease causes a lot of tumors on his face and, and body. And so he wants you to ask his permission before you start examining those or asking questions about his disease. Don't push me or lecture me. He calls those bricks on my head. <laughs> he does much better with a fun sense of humor than if you demand or talk over his head. Um, <clears throat> he, he will always, if he has to have um, any kind of medical procedure, he wants choices about how it's done when it's possible. For example, if he has to have surgery, he would much rather have a needle over the bad pasting medicine and the gas mask. So hopefully you can see how this would help a medical professional support David in their office. This is another medical professional's, um, another 
one page profile for a kid designed for medical professionals. Liam is a child who has a medical um, diagnosis and causes him to have both blindness and deafness. And so I'll point out a couple of things really quickly. Um, and I'll tell you, his mother sent this to two new doctors before they were going. The first doctor, it landed in his junk, junk box and he didn't see it. And that she said the appointment was disastrous. But the second doctor did get it and showed it to everybody in the clinic, including the ladies at the front desk who would admit them. Um, and everybody knew how to support Liam in that setting. For example, uh, important to Liam is to know who you are by feeling your identifier. For example, a watch, a ring, a necklace, a bracelet, a name tag, and letting mom or dad introduce you. So everybody, the ladies at the front desk, showed him their ring or a necklace so he would know who they were. Um, when he got into the medical appointment, um, he needs you you to let him know what's happening before you start a procedure. For example, if you're going to use a stethoscope, show him how to listen to his own heart. Let him feel that stethoscope. Maybe he hears your heart before you go in to listen to his. So hopefully you can see how this would be helpful to a medical professional. Now I want to show you how to do one of these. First of all, and I'll tell you because my biggest concern about sharing this tool so what I've seen people do with it when they've seen a one-page profile without really studying how to do it, they um, create what I call a cute little scrapbook page with lots of cute pictures and lots of fun information, but it's not helpful to the context. So ask yourself these questions first. Where am I going to use this one-page profile? What is your context? Am I going to show this to the geneticist we're meeting with? Or am I going to show this to the bus driver that picks my son up for school? Or am I going to show this to the algebra teacher at high school? Or am I going to show this to the Boy Scout leader? Where, it, where is this going to be used? Because where it's going to be used will drive the information you include on it. What's your context? And then, once you've determined your context, ask yourself, what do I want people in that context to learn about this child or this young adult? And how is support best provided in that context? You know, support on a bus looks a whole lot different than support in the geneticist office or in the algebra class. So what does support look like in that context? Because if it's not read and it's not used, it's not going to be helpful. So your context for this today's presentation would be healthcare settings. Ask yourself, what do people like or admire about this person in healthcare settings? Avoid functioning levels and instead focus on this person's personality, their gifts, their abilities. What do they love? What do we love about this kid? And then what's important to this person in this context of healthcare settings? What's important to them at medical appointments or healthcare settings? Um, I have a friend whose daughter, one of the things on her one page profile is says, says uh, don't ask her to get on the scale or take her height, just ask mom. Just trust mom for that information. In fact, it might even need to trust mom for her blood pressure because some of those procedures are very unsettling to the daughter. And the daughter, the mom, it, it keeps a very close tabs on her medical care for her daughter, and she has that information. And then the third most important question is, how is this person best supported in this context? So I gave you some questions to prompt your thinking. You know, what causes your child to have anxiety in this healthcare setting or discomfort or fear? And then to support what helps them feel safe. How does this person best communicate? Are there supports that can be helpful? Are there things that staff can do to prepare the person for procedures, exams, care, or services? How does this person express pain and how is that pain alleviated? Are there accommodations that you need ahead of time or at the time of the appointment? Any other tips? Those would go under best supports. And so I think we have some good time for questions here. Um, I ran through that stuff. I will give you my uh, email address. If there's a question we don't get to today or you want more information later, feel free to email me. Let me know where you heard 
me speak, and I'll be happy to help you later if I can't help today. But I'll turn it back over to Susan. Thanks. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, Laura. And I think those one-page profiles make so much sense, and I wish that um, we had known about those many, many years ago. And I do hope that those of you on this webinar today will, will utilize those because it will be incredibly helpful. Um, thank you for that. Um, and we can open it up for some questions now for Dr. Scott and Laura. And I believe, uh, Justin, you had mentioned you, do you, did you have a question? Yes, yes, I do. Um, I, uh, Dr. Scott, I am a, a special education teacher as well as an in-home care attendant for adults with special needs. Um, I have... I work with a family whose son has um, Fragile X. Um, I believe he's about 30 now. Um, but um, I've also been reading, uh, I've also been reading an article on charge syndrome, which mentions the chorionic villi sampling. And um, it, so is this uh, charge is the uh, leading genetic cause of deaf blindness uh, at at birth in the U.S. So is is the is, is this type of testing common for you know, genetic counseling? So one of the and, things, and and who should get tested? So the, I'll go for the first part and then I'll, then I'll try to remember the second part. Okay. Actually, no. I'll go okay. <laughs> Whenever we, when we sit down and we talk about prenatal testing, it's really kind of up to you. And so you'll never hear me ever say you need to do this test. In mm -hmm. fact, when we, when we see kids in clinic, um, we say, we think that this would be a helpful thing, but parents can say, I don't think so. And I will not fight them tooth and nail unless I think it's actually something that is so important or their child <laughs> mm -hmm. seriously affect their health and safety. Uh, so that being said, what is chorionic villa sampling? Basically, um, you can think about every, any, any pregnancy, there's the baby, and then there's all this stuff that supports the baby. Part of that is the placenta, and we think about placenta, and we kind of can... Right. There's also these things called chorionic villi. They're not the baby, but they're close to the baby. And because they are all derived from that same egg and sperm that came to form that baby's body, you can actually take a sampling of those chorionic villi and you can do the same genetic test that you do on a child that's, that's already been born. So if you can name a test, a genetic test, almost always we can do the same test prenatally. What we're more commonly think about is amniocentesis where you take a needle and you actually get the, some of the fluid that's around the baby and it has the right. cells in it. The chorionic villi are a little bit more separated from that. In other words, we say, well, are they an accurate sample of what the baby's going to have in their genetic, genetic comp complement? Not, not as easy because again, there's more divisions that are, that separate the baby from the chorionic villi and compared to the baby and the amniocytes, but they're basically two different options. How would you get that? Um, this would be something that you should you should talk over with your with your OBGYN. So you're the, basically the same doctor who takes care of you if you have a pregnancy. Sometimes they'll refer you to a person called an MFM, which is a maternal fetal medicine specialist, and they might do these type of procedures. But these are procedures that can be used for many different disorders, and it would help families okay. if it, this particular pregnancy is affected or not. Okay. Yeah, I, I, um, one of my other clients uh, is a 39-year-old with um, Angelman syndrome, and I know that his family has had uh, genetic tests done, and they did find a deletion in the 15th chromosome, I believe. Yep, you were absolutely so, yeah. but But they have two sons that, they have two other sons that are not affected, so... So these, the genetic testing, again, is, is pretty much anything you want or you could do after birth. These days, you could do it pre, prenatally. Okay. 
many people have different reasons for doing that. Sometimes people say, well, I'm not interested in this because I would never consider terminating a pregnancy. But there's right. when understanding what you are going to have. In other words, knowing beforehand can still be very helpful. You can imagine, you can either, I mean, sometimes the not knowing is the most stressful thing, right? And so mm-hmm. when people think about these, you should really think what would be helpful. Some people do not want to know. That's fine. Other people really, really want to know. And that's fine too. And, and the risks of these procedures are so small that although it exists, these are not very, very risky things these days. And so right. even if you say, well, this would help me just with my anxiety, that might be a very reasonable reason to do so. Okay. Thank you. You bet. Thank you. Are there other questions for Dr. Scott or Ms. Buckner? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm so glad I signed this up this morning. Uh, I did have a conflict, so I thought, hmm, I shouldn't sign up. But something prompted me to sign up, and it turned out to be very personal because I didn't know Dr. Scott was speaking for this. I met him uh, at the Stress to Strength uh, Family Facilitation. Uh, facilitation. And uh, Laura, you also hit around the door now because I have been participating a little bit on the uh, person center um, kind of uh, um, uh, support for the IDD community. I think it's a different organization, but I'm going to check yours out too. Anyway, but what really prompted me wanted to come this because uh, there's a piece of gene in my daughter's husband, okay? side that's fragile X. And how do I find out? Because my son-in-law's sister had to go through a very, very traumatic infertilization in Connecticut. They don't live here. And uh, she's, she got a daughter now, but she's having problem conceiving or, or made the egg stick the second time. And I think she already had all the eggs tested. And I studied fragile X when I heard about that. And I think my son-in-law is okay. Like, you know, what Dr. Scott just went through the pedigraph. Uh, they also had my daughter tested and he tested the blood. And now they have a girl and they just had a boy. And I feel like there's no chance for him to pass the pre, uh, pre what do you call that? pre mutation, Right. Because my daughter is not a carrier, we know that. Mm-hmm. So, am I right about that? I don't have to worry about the boy yeah. grandson. I mean, boy grandson and the girl granddaughter. Am I right about that? Yeah. So, so in this case, if it's your son-in-law, come from the mother, come from uh, son son-in-law's mother, yes. son-in-law's mom, then to then potentially to him as the son, right? So, if it's a male and he's a premutation carrier. He cannot pass that on to his sons. So, for example, it's easier probably to do my family. I have seven children. I have a premutation on my X chromosome. All of my girls get my X chromosome. So even before they were tested, we knew that they were carriers because I had been tested. And so we sat down as a family. And we still remember this. We all sat down. My girls were, I don't know, maybe like, I don't know, somewhere between eight and maybe 15 and we explained to them that each one of them would be a carrier for this and what that would mean to them. And over time, I've actually had that same conversation with every single one of their husbands before they were married. So after they got in, got engaged, I, I encouraged them to tell their husbands beforehand that they were carriers for something that could cause their children to have developmental disabilities and intellectual disability. And then when they got engaged, it was time for them to meet with me. And we would sit down and I remember explaining to them each one and their, each one of their reactions was different. Most of them knew that this was a possibility, but didn't really get it. And then they're like, I remember one, he said, wow, this is way bigger and way more important than I ever thought. I said, you get it. Like you get what this is. So far, every one of my three daughters who are married have all chosen to have children just naturally and, and let God decide what's gonna happen. Uh, this is part of just what they do and their choice. I have 
nieces and nephews, though, that have gone through plea and punishment like diagnosis. And so I know that that's also a possibility. And they were guaranteed, essentially, to have children that did not have that. So what you said about your, your son, my boys, my boys do not have this. They will have inherited my Y chromosome. We have not had them tested in the week because they are not older. And so that would just be a useless procedure for them. There's no point in them being tested for fragile. Yeah, that- I think my, my son in law tested, and I think. Oops, you, were, you muted yourself. Oh, okay. Uh, I think my son in law is tested, and I don't think he's a carrier. So, for that reason, because it's his mother that was a carrier, but not his father. So, my mother was a carrier. And so, my mother was a carrier, and she passed it on to me. Oh. So, yeah, so mothers can definitely pass it on to their sons. And so, my mother passed the, her premutation on to me and to my older brother. We, don't, we had one brother who did not want to be tested, he still does not know his status. He passed it on to my sister who had premature ovarian insufficiency after her first daughter was born. She had premature menopause and then adopted two more children. Um, and so we've seen everything in our family. We've seen it all. Um, but yes, if, you're, if the mother-in-law has it, your son-in-law may have it. If he was tested and is negative, then he got the good X chromosome from his mom and not the one that has the premutation on it. Um, and so it just depends. If he was not a premutation carrier, well, then it'd be really kind of a, a lot of work to actually do pre-implantation genetic diagnosis because there would be no diagnosis to make. Yeah, it would be a, you'd be looking for something different. Thank you. I think that's the case, but I'm going to verify that. Now, now I know a little bit more, but I think that's what I heard. But So I think we're okay there. Thank you. That would be helpful. Yeah. Thank you. And we are... A little bit over time, but we could probably take one more question. There's one more burning question. Okay, um, I do have a question. I apologize, I'm appearing on phone, uh, Jacqueline. All right, in my hmm. family, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. we can hear yes. you. Oh, okay. All right, uh, in my family, my uh, grandfather passed the fragile X gene to all of his daughters, but um, I didn't know I carried it until after I had my kids. So I actually don't, I'm not a pre-mutation carrier. I have the full mutation, you know, of fragile X. And so that's what I passed on to both of my children. So my daughter, my concern would be, we're mentioning earlier for my daughter in having children, uh, you said the le- it's less likely for them to pass on a full mutation if they have them early, but she already, she's not a pre-mutation. She full mutation, intellectual disability, so in that situation, does it matter how early they have kids? Or would she be more of an intro fertilization type? Because she has a mild intellectual disability, so but so she's not, you know, normally functioning. But for the most part, if you look at her, because she's a girl, you can't tell. You don't right. know. She does everything every other girl does. It's just she needs help with math and, and science and money. And, and But she drives and does everything else. Oh, but, yeah, so earlier, yeah. Double check to make sure I got this correct. So you have two boys who have fragile X. No, I have a a son and a daughter. My my son has since passed away, but that's another story for another day. But they both have fragile X. Okay, the gene came through my grandfather, who Uh passed it on to my mother. Mm -hmm. Um, So and they have a ton of girls, and I have a ton of cousins with fragile X. But when my mom had me and my sister, we did not know until Mm -hmm. I had my children. Got and it. then that's what we realized. Okay. So the question is your daughter, who's a full mutation carrier, should you think about having yeah. children earlier because she would be at risk for having for ovarian insufficiency? That's the question. The, the answer to that is she should not be at higher risk. So because she has a full mutation, her, ex, her, her fragile X gene is actually shut down completely. And so it doesn't function. It does not make that toxic product that hurts ovaries. And so we would not expect her to be at higher risk for having premature ovarian insufficiency. And so in her particular case, um, she will still go to menopause sometime, right? And it does get harder and harder to have kids over time just naturally. Um, But as far as actually saying she at higher risk for such problems, she would not be. Is that helpful? 
Yeah, and and her risk of but is still 50-50 no matter what age she has that children. Is that is correct. correct. Her, her risk, yeah. because she's a full mutation carrier, there's only two possibilities. One is she passes on her ex that has the full mutation, and that child will have fragile X syndrome, or she passes on the one that does not, and that person should not be a pre-mutation carrier or a fragile X carrier, or, frag, or have fragile X, because that would be her normal chromosome, her normal X chromosome. Okay. If, if you want to review this, we could sit down and talk about this again, because I don't want to make sure, I want to make sure that we do it right. <laughs> and so it's always a little hard to do this on the, on the fly, but based on what you said, that is the correct answer is what I just gave. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I understand. Yeah. I was just wanting to make sure I, I completely understood because you mentioned something about having kids earlier and I was trying to make sure I understood what, what that meant and what that, that was about. Our, that would be for our pre-mutation female daughter. Mm -hmm sisters, et cetera, that would be the advice and counsel we would give if they're planning to have children. It would be better to think about doing it earlier versus later. Okay. Okay. And the other question is about the, the putting, it may not necessarily be for you, but for the lady that spoke. When you're putting together those profile things, like for my daughter, I just send a, um, an email to all of her teachers. But with that, but when she gets older, you know, because she's going to be a senior in high school next year. Um, would it be some sort of profile that she would put together or something that we would come up with that she could pass on to maybe professors uh, if she goes to like community college or, or maybe something that you use for jobs? I mean, how do you use that once there? Absolutely. Well, that would, that's where you really pay attention to the context. And mm -hmm. it's absolutely something that your daughter and maybe you, the two of you could do together. Um, the key is making sure that you're really clear about who you're talking to because what health professionals need to know about my son is very different than what a high school teacher would need to know or what a college professor would need to know or a bus driver would need to know. You know, it's so really pay attention to your context and then focus, that in, focus your information specific to that context around the important to and how to best support. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you all for these great questions. And really, thank you, Dr. Scott and Laura for um, outstanding presentations. This has been wonderful today. And I really appreciate it. Thank you all for joining us today. And, and um, Dr. Sherry Benson is putting in the two Fragile X clinics in Texas. One is at UT in Dallas, and the other one is at Texas Children's Hospital. And there, so there is information in the chat there about that as well. And Dinah Godwin is the social worker contact um, at the Fragile X Clinic at Texas Children's. So um, I really thank you all today. This is a lot of information and resources, and I'll be sending out the survey, which we ask that you all complete, and I put it in the chat. And then also uh, we'll send it out by email and with um, Ms. Butner's handouts. So Thank you, and have a great day. Thanks, you guys. Later. Thank Bye. you. Bye, Daryl. Bye, Bye, Susan. Thank you Bye -bye, all. Bye-bye, Laura. Bye, Daryl.